So Joshua chapter 3 is where we focus on today. Uh, it's a wonderful passage. And a passage that uh, uh, it's so easy to use or read just as a narrative. And yet it has such rich meaning for us right now, today. And some wonderful blessings that we can get from it. So I'm really uh, looking forward to the richness of this passage today. Let's go to our Lord prayer and pray with it. Heavenly Father, we count it as a privilege to be able to open up your word this morning. To be able to listen to the Spirit of God within us, teaching us what this passage has for us today, even though it was written thousands of years ago. Lord, it still is applicable right now. And so we implore you, Lord, show us what it means for us. Teach us how to enact it in our lives today. Not for our own outcome, but Lord, may we first of all glorify you and bless others through our actions. So Lord, take your word and teach us this morning I pray. In Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Sunday evening we've been uh, having the privilege of Kevin Vigas come to teach us about uh, the Jewish or Israelite way of looking at the Bible and the world and then he's been teaching us about kindness. So kindness is a, uh, a, a Jewish term which relates to the structure of a passage. Um, and chapter 3 is in itself a complete kaiser. And I'll wrap it up at the end of today with showing you the kaiser at its work, but it really gives or brings great meaning to this whole passage. We're going to start off with Verse number one, by itself. And it says this, Then Joshua rose early in the morning, and they set out from Akashi Grove, and came to the river Jordan, and all the, he and all the children of Israel had lodged there before they crossed over. Now, if you, um, if you find that uh, your Bible has a slightly different meaning, um, so... From Acacia Grove, if it says Shittim, or sometimes Abel Shittim, that is the same place, uh, it's probably a region that they were rather than a city or, or a, a town that they were, they were staying in. The, the number of Israelites were probably quite large at this place. So they're, they're on the east side of the Jordan River, and their goal is to get to Jericho, which means, of course, they have to, at some stage, cross the Jordan. You might remember that Joshua and Caleb some 40 odd years ago, or previous to this event, had already crossed over the, the, uh, the river and gone to Jericho and said, This is a wonderful place, and God has provided with us uh, a land flowing with milk and honey, and we should go and take it. But the other 10 spies that were with them gave a negative report, and so therefore the Israelites spent 40 days wandering. So they're there at Shittim, they're about to cross the Jordan and take the land that God had provided to them. They had to uh, cross over this river, which wasn't the widest of rivers, it wasn't like the crossing of the Red Sea, but at this period of time, they were in full flood, and the river itself was somewhat impassable to a group of people who were carrying all their possessions and their family. Maybe to uh, you know, 12 spies to cross over the river wasn't such a challenge, but to a whole group of Israelite people, that was indeed a challenge. So what can we get from this one verse straight away? They went. They got up. And they started their journey. I wonder how many times we fail to achieve anything or fail to receive God's glory or God's blessing because we stayed at home. We didn't go I wonder how many times we stay because of fear. What if somebody's going to uh, laugh at me? What if somebody will challenge me? Or the other fear of, but I'm not as good as this person. At the moment in Australia, we have a, a, a number of churches who are without pastors, without men who will actually stand up and preach the gospel. And that is, of course, our mission as Christians to go out and teach the world. So why is it we have churches without pastors? Well, it's because people aren't going. 
Because people aren't standing up and saying, God, what is it you have for me? And like Joshua and Caleb, they understood what God had for them and they said, we're going to go. It was unfortunate that the other ten said, we're too scared. We have too much fear. So we, as Christians, have to stand up and say, well, God, where do you want me to go? And it doesn't have to be across the ocean. In this case, the Jordan River was just a, a fairly minor river uh, in the Middle East at this time. But uh, they went. They got up. And they started to cross the river. Our next set of verses here is to show that they weren't just going blindly. It says in verses 2 to 4, So it was after three days that the officers went through the camp, and they commanded the people, saying, When you see the ark of the covenant of the Lord your God, and the priests, the Levites, bearing it, then you shall set out for your place and go after it. Yet there shall be a space between you and it, about 2,000 cubits by measure. Do not come near it, that you may know the way by which you must go, for you have not passed this way before. Interesting passage, some, some conundrums in that particular one. The first thing I want you to remember is this. As the Israelites, as the Israelites were, uh, um, as the Israelites were, were traveling uh, within the desert for 40 years, and they didn't uh, go by themselves, they were led. They were led, of course, by a pillar of cloud during the day and a pillar of fire at night. They were led. It's not known whether this pillar of cloud or pillar of fire is still here at this time, but it was not necessary now because they had the Ark of the Covenant and God had said, let that be your life. So when it said to the Israelite people, we don't want you to come close, remember there is a massive people, there is tens of thousands of people here, they, if they pass by it, if they go off track, potentially they could lose sight of their direction. So God is here directing them. Let the Ark of the Covenant guide you. What does that mean for us? Well, of course, we know that the Ark of the Covenant contained uh, the Ten Commandments. And it wasn't the Ark itself that was so special, it was what was inside the Ark. What does that mean for us? We have the Spirit of God, who is supposed to be our guide. And we have to be led by the Spirit, and we have to follow it. Now, to follow at a distance may seem a bit strange. We want to be able to keep it in front of us so that we don't lose sight of it. Not too far, but not too far away either. We need to maintain sight of it. Now, this was talking about the congregation of Israel at this particular time. This is talking about a group of people which was a wide mob and would actually cross the river uh, not just at one point, one single point. And I'll get to that why that is in the that they were encouraging them to all be able to see the ark as they cross. To be able to see their focus, to be able to see what is their guide, what is their, their leader. Which is why it's important that we each have a Bible ourselves, which is why it's important that we each have the Holy Spirit inside us. So that we can each maintain contact with, be able to see, be able to learn from and glean things from our God. Now why don't they God? Uh, that 2,000 cubits, by the way, a cubit is roughly 50 centimetres, so we are talking about a kilometre. So they are right, they're asking people to stay at least a kilometre away from this. But it says, for you have not passed this way before. And it's true, there was only 12 people who had passed that way before, and then most of the people had it, most of the commanders of the army had it. So they wanted to make sure that we stayed together as a fellowship. Another good reason as to why we use God as our guide because he wants us to fellowship with each other. He wants us to stay strong and united with each other. He wants us to pray for and with each other. He wants us to support each other in physical needs and physical health and physical care as well. So it's an interesting set of verses. Um, but lots to learn. And I just want you to, to think about that. Jesus needs to be our leading God, we need to remain in sight with Him. The next few verses, it changes to focus a little bit more on 
the individual and the person. So it says in uh, Joshua verse 5, actually, sorry, I think that is the wrong verse. Uh, let's go to verses uh, 7 and uh, just read verse 7, please. And the Lord said to Joshua, This day I will begin to exalt you in the sight of all Israel, that they may know that as I was with Moses, so I will be with you. Think about the fact that Joshua has just taken over from Moses, this leadership, and probably a lot of people were wondering still, is he capable? Is he going to be good enough? Is he like Moses in, in many ways? Will he talk with God the same way Moses talked with God? Will God talk with him? There's a lot of questions in people's minds as to whether Joshua will be good enough. If you have a look at the picture there, there's one bowl which is not shaped correctly. That may be a feeling that some of us have at different times of our lives. Everyone else is fine, everyone else looks perfect, everyone else seems to be doing just well, and I don't feel that, I don't experience that same joy that other people are experiencing. You may be feeling like that. God is telling Joshua that he is fine, that he will be with you, that he will provide you with the strength and the guidance of everything he needs. What do you think about that? No matter what you think about yourself, God says you're just fine. Amen. You're ideal for his purpose. It doesn't matter how old you are. It doesn't matter how much you know of the word of God. You're just fine to do his work, to share the gospel, to be a witness to others. Don't compare yourself to others. God will provide it. I repeat what he says in this verse. This day I will begin to exalt you, God says, in the sight of all in Israel, that they may know that as I was with Moses, so I will be with you. He has God's strength. He has God's promise with him. <coughs> he doesn't need to be concerned about am I good enough? Am I enough? So I'm, I'm doing my words with a lot more words mixed up there, but I want you to see how reflective this uh, verse is. So Joshua has just been directed by God, and in verse 8 he continues, You shall command the priests who bear the ark of the covenant, saying, When you have come to the edge of the water of the Jordan, you shall stand in the Jordan. So this is God speaking to Joshua. So Joshua said to the children of Israel, Come here and hear the words of the Lord your God, and Joshua said, By this you shall know that the living God is among you, and that he will, without fail, drive out from before you the Perizzites, uh, sorry, the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Hivites, and the Perizzites, and the Gergeshites, and the Amorites, and the Jebusites. Joshua didn't try to do things himself. He didn't try to be more eloquent than God. Joshua just told the people, This is what God is doing. And it repeats you God's word. And some people, when they, when they go about witnessing to others, think that they have to be clever with their speech, that they have to be amazing with their imagery, that they have to use great metaphors, etc. That's all nice. Uh, some preachers, for instance, they will use um, uh, a, a lot of alliteration in their presentations of the PowerPoints. That's nice. There's nothing wrong with that. That's not what God is saying. God is saying, follow my words. Do as I ask. Don't do anything more. I will be with you. I will give you my words. Just repeat what I'm saying. So there we have a, a, an image of the Bible which is being reflected. Do we need to create our own version? No. We have God's word. All we have to do is reflect it. Repeat it. And that's what Joshua did. Although the only thing he left out was the praise or the exaltation of himself. Joshua showed humbleness as he repeated God's word to his people. He says in verse 11, Behold the ark of the covenant, the Lord of all the earth is crossing over before you into the Jordan at the end, saying, God will lead you across 
He continues in verse 12 and he says, Now therefore take for yourselves twelve men from the tribes of Israel, one man from every tribe. And it shall come as the soul, as soon as the soles of the feet of the priests who bear the ark of the Lord, the Lord of all the earth shall rest in the waters of Jordan. Uh, sorry, the, uh, the Lord of all the earth shall rest in the waters of Jordan, that the waters of the Jordan shall be cut off, the waters that come down from upstream, and they, may, they shall stand as a heap. I'm just going to go back a few slides, just to show you that map once again. So we see that map. We know that crossing from Shizuka to Jericho. So it's a fairly straight distance. And they did pretty much go straight across. We see that there's a city called Adam, which is now not present as it is then, though as it was then. But that's where the waters will walk up. A long distance away. So the, the waters flow from the Sea of Galilee down to the Dead Sea. Um, it was a mountainous area, there was lots of water that would flow down from the mountains, especially uh, we know that the, the, the uh, river of Jordan was flooded at the time. It says that in, in, in this passage. But at Adam, so this is many kilometres away, at Adam, the waters were walk up. This was to enable this large crowd to go around, still maintaining a one kilometre distance from the Ark of the Covenant, to go and surround and go around the Ark. It's a huge distance to travel. For that mass of water to, to dry up is an absolute wonder. There is no possible, uh, normal way of trying to understand how that water uh, uh, stopped, dried up. It didn't dry up. It wasn't uh, dry season. It was definitely wet season. Um, it is a miraculous wonder. I take courage from that. Because if God can do that, then what can he do with you? What can he do with me? What is he able to achieve with a flawed vessel that I am? What is he able to do with you? Regardless of your current situation. God consulted Joshua because <coughs> Joshua followed his plan. Because Joshua was obedient to his word. And because Joshua got up and went. Joshua was not afraid of what might be on the other side of the Jordan. God had already given them the land. He had already promised that. And we know that it eventually came true. Joshua was confident that God's strategy or plan was going to work. Joshua's words were to his commanders, to, to the leaders of his people. Joshua's words were a witness, but not just his words, so were his actions. So many of us, we don't actually work in uh, or witness in action because we don't turn up, because we don't go to fellowship meetings, because we don't go to prayer meetings. What is our witness? What are we actually saying? What are we saying about God in our lives? And I know that for some of us, especially right now, a lot has been ill, a lot has been laid up. But what about when we are here? There are so many jobs, there are so many functions that we could participate in. What is your witness? Are we relying on God's strength to do everything we can? To be a good witness? To other people. Joshua witnessed to all of Israel through his leadership and following God's command. So then we see that in Joshua verses 10 to 13 that uh, they are crossing and it says in verse 13 it shall come to pass as soon as the soul is there, as soon as they touch the water those who bear the ark the Lord of all the earth, remember this is his wonder, shall, uh, the, the Lord of all the earth shall rest in the waters of the Jordan, that the waters of the Jordan shall be cut off. They didn't just dribble down to a, uh, a, um, a, uh, a, a small slurry or slush. They were cut off. The waters that came down from upstream, and they shall stand up as a heap. They weren't damned by a person or a person's. It was too, too quick, too immediate, and they just stood in a heap. 
God is looking to do a wonder in us. God wants to, he's looking forward to being able to exalt us. Not that we should seek exalting, like Joshua didn't seek exalting, but God wants to display you as a wonder and for you to be a witness to him. Are we standing in his way? Is that our problem? Or are we saying, God, I'm yours. I'm wholly yours. Let my life be that witness. God doesn't want us to be in the dark. God wants to lead us. We're not doing it alone. We are completely in his care. Completely. As God has blessed and taken care of Joshua. So we move on now to verse 14. So Joshua gives, a, gives his commands now to uh, his people, um, and so they start to move. So it was when the people set out for their camp to cross over the Jordan with the priest bearing the Ark of the Covenant before the people. So remember, the Ark of the Covenant is moved and is in front. And as those who bore the Ark came into the Jordan, and the feet of the priests who bore the Ark dipped into the edge of the water, for the Jordan overflows all its banks during the whole time of the harvest. Now the waters which came down from upstream stood still and rose in a heap very far away at Adam, the city that is beside Zeratan. So the waters that went down into the sea of Arabah, the salt sea, failed and were cut off and the people crossed over opposite Jericho. <coughs> God not only promised to perform a wonder, he did the wonder. Not that Jericho, oh, sorry, Joshua or, uh, or the priest did anything special, they just stepped into the water. They just got themselves wet. They took that risk. I don't see how God is going to do it, but he's told me that he will. And he blessed the Israelites at that stage. But of course we can see that it's all glory to God. Joshua just obeyed. The Israelites stepped into the water. And it wasn't that the priests were anything special. The priests were just given a, a limited, limited function to do that work. They didn't uh, do anything themselves with that, that made their stepping in the water anything different to anyone else. They were not special at all. But they stepped forward as God had commanded, and God performed the wonder. <coughs> so we can take that to the bank because we know that God is actually doing a wonder in ourselves. When you look back at, at your life, what it used to be like before you became a Christian, are you the same? Do you look back and wonder, how did I get here? How did I become like this? But He's still performing wonders. He hasn't stopped. Whilst we may not any longer see the miracles of, uh, like we see in, in uh, Joshua's time, he is still performing a wonder in his work, and he still wants to, he still seeks to perform a wonder in you. What that wonder is, I don't know. But, and you may be misshapen and out of out of place. And that's fine. God still wants to perform a wonder in you. The final verse. Final verse there, verse 17. When the priests, the men the priests who bore the ark of the covenant of the Lord stood to firm on dry ground in the midst of the Jordan, all Israel crossed over on dry ground until all the people had crossed completely over the Jordan. God knew that the Israelites had to cross the river to get to their promised land. They stepped out in obedience and God provided the way. Can you imagine that excitement? of those Israelites when they're walking across on dry land. Can you imagine that praise they would have? Can you imagine the wonder they would have to a God that was their God? But that's an example for us very much so because nothing has changed except God has expanded his focus to the Gentiles, which is most of us unless you're Jewish yourself. And God really seeks to show you a way forward in your life. Some of us might be thinking this, that there's nothing for me forward. There absolutely is. There's a land of milk and honey waiting for us. 
But it comes about in stepping forward. With us having the courage to say, I trust you, God. I don't know what it is you want me to do. I don't know what's on the other side. Although they didn't have spies to tell them that it was pretty good. But I don't know what it is, but I'm going to step forward anyway. I'm going to ask you to guide me and prove to me that you are still in the job of performing miracles in me. God fulfills his promises. So let me go back to the Kaizen that I've mentioned before. So this is the structure. A Kaizen is a, like a reflective structure, uh, very much like a haiku poem from the Japanese or, or perhaps a lyric. Um, we can see that in verse 1, they started moving. In verses 2 to 4, we saw that the Ark of the Covenant, which the Levitical priests will carry, uh, led them, went on before them. So they were following the Ark of the Covenant. In verses 3 to 5, we see that the Lord performs, or will, will perform, wonders among you. Then Joshua repeats, relays, regurgitates those commands to the people, teaches the people, witnesses to the people in his life. And in the centre of this, in the centre of the reflection, it has the words of God, the words of the Lord, right in the centre, pivoting this whole action that we see in chapter 3. Then we see that Joshua, listening to those words, go and enact them and share, that, and share those directions with, you, with their commanders, etc., to start, to start moving. And what do we see? Because he's told them, you know, didn't defeat in the water. We see that the wonder, the miracle that God had promised happens, comes true. And finally, we see that and reflected that the priests are coming out and coming ahead of them. When we see that, this is what we can, we can read from it for our lives. One, read the Word of God, study the Word of God, make sure that the Word of God is in front of you. Make sure you're listening and paying attention to what it has for you. If we do that, the Lord will perform wonders amongst us. The Lord will enrich your life. The Lord will satisfy your needs. The Lord just get that wrong, the wrong way, don't we? We ask God to satisfy our needs, and then I'll bring to it. Then I'll come to you. But no, we have to do it in this order. Read the Word of God. Meditate on the Word of God. Then God will perform one wonders amongst you. Then your words... Your words will be of God. Because you've studied and, and, and read and taken in the word of God. They will become your words. And central to that is keep on listening, keep on praying, keep on studying that word. Then your life will be a reflection of God's as you witness to others. And it won't actually be you as such witnessing, but it will be gone through you. It will be the Lord work. Then the miracles will, will be performed. The wonders will happen in your life. Yes. And you'll be able to praise Him and honor Him. Just as Joshua didn't take on any honor himself, he said, Praise God, look what God is doing in, in, in our lives. And then finally, we will be stronger at the world of our lives. Several years ago, we had some trouble in this church, and we we had some turmoil, and we said as a leadership group, we are going to put the word of God first. And everyone that was uh, in, in the leadership group at the time, about 11, 12 of us, we said we want the God, the word of God, to be first in our lives. And so that's what we taught, that's what we preached, that's what we prayed upon. Focus on the word of God, and I get to lead us. I truly believe that uh, he has performed a wonder amongst us. He said he will grow his church. And uh, we took him at his word. And we said we will obey. We will lead. We will step forward as a church. At the time, we didn't even have a pastor. He took care of it. Miraculously, it might be. But we followed his word. We read the word of God, we focus on his word, not just for now, but also for the future, and I promise the nights. I think our witness has been stronger, our unity has been stronger, our fellowship has been much, much better. 
since we've gone through and had to travel through this, this hard time. But we can look back and say, what a work God has done. As God has grown his church, as God has strengthened his people, as God has created love within his group of people, which in my opinion is amazing. What are you doing? Continue to focus on the word of God. We need the word of God to come us. And raise him for his spirit and his holiness. This is a very applicable passage for us even today. Can I see it? Can I close your to it? I hope you can see it. But remember it started with something. Get up and go. Whatever that means for you. Be wrong. Say hello to someone you haven't seen hello to perhaps. Put your name down for a roster. It's a work. Turn up at the busy league. Kill the last busy league was fantastic. Such good fun. Get to know different people. Get to learn with different people. But whatever it makes, get up and go. As Josh and you. As they put their step and put their flea in the water. Keep their toe. See what God can do with your life. Now, Heavenly Father, we give thank you for your word. We thank you for the way it's constructed, Lord, for the way that it teaches us. We thank you for the love that it shows that you have for us. Even though we are imperfect, Lord, even though we don't stand up to other people's measures or even our own, it's certainly not yours. But Lord, you work with us anyway. And you encourage us, you support us. Lord, we're so grateful. We're so grateful that your word is clear, that your word is able to be understood. And Lord, even though this message may not be for everyone, Lord, your spirit, I know, is using it in a way to encourage and inspire others. So Lord, we thank you for the way that you bring us and touch us. Lord, may we continue to focus on the word of God and putting that first in all aspects of our life. Not that we may be glorified, but that you, Lord, may be glorified through our lives, through our business. Thank you for being clear this morning. We pray these things now in Jesus' name. Amen.